Good afternoon, my name is Carolyn McKenzie Williams and I'll be demonstrating the importance of surgery check-in. Um, I have an admission form right here. Here at Swan Animal Clinic we utilize electronic and paper records since we are able to scan in records directly to the computer and attach them into our software cornerstone. We can utilize both. Um, this is an admission form. It shows the signalment of our patient. We've got patient name here, species canine, uh, shepherd mix who is one years old, a spayed female, and we've got weight here. Um, on this paper, if she were to have any pertinent uh, medical history that we needed to know about, it would be down here. Um, I'll go ahead and show you the equivalent of this on our software cornerstone. So if there were um, a patient alert, you would it would show right here. So this patient is allergic to penicillin, and um, it's all he's also a diabetic. And so this would also show the signalman as well. Um, 14 pounds, six year old canine dachshund named Bentley. Um, and so we could print this out and it would show on the bottom of the form, patient is allergic to penicillin and is a diabetic. Pause. Okay, permanent patient records would be found in our software cornerstone. I will go ahead and show you our patient Bentley's. Um, here you can see his vaccine history. Um, you can click here and it will show you that he's all up to date on all of his vaccines and what date they are due. Um, you could also look at his previous lab work on this tab as well, um, or this tab. This would show you um, previous lab work such as uh, CBC, Chem 17 and Lights, urine, urinalysis. Um, this one would show you previous um, prescriptions that have been prescribed. Um, and then this shows the total complete history. So this patient has had radiographs recently. Um, if there were any previous medical records that we needed to attach into the computer, we could. It would be located under the medical notes tab. And we could um, attach previous vaccine history from previous um, veterinary clinics. We could also attach any lab work, anything. We would scan that into the computer and attach it directly to that tab. Okay, it is imperative for every client that is checking in their pet for surgery to sign a consent and release form. Um, here's our paper one. Um, this goes through pre-anesthetic blood work, pain medication, rabies vaccination, um, consent and agreement. Um, the client would sign here and put a phone number and date it. Um, we also utilize this online. And so our clients can go to our website at amarillovet.com. They click here on client forms go to the pre-anesthetic check-in form. And this form will take them through um, pre-anesthetic blood work, pain medications, anything extra that they need, and then they do an electronic signature for this. Um, okay, pause it. Hi, I'm Jared Williams. I'm here to check in Bentley Williams for his uh, neuter today. Okay, great. All right, I will have you sign this consent form. So, would you like any pre-anesthetic blood work for Bentley? Well, do I really need it? Yes, we always want to do pre-anesthetic blood work before we anesthetize any patient to make sure that they're a good candidate for anesthesia and make sure that their liver and kidney values are good before we anesthetize. Okay, well, I want my baby to be safe. Okay. I'm going to accept the highest level blood work. Okay. Would you like pain medication for Bentley today? I don't know. I don't think he needs it. Um, I think he would need it. Okay. Since we're performing a neuter, the surgeon will be um, incising him, so he might experience a little bit of pain when you go home. Well, okay then. Only the best for my baby. All right. Has Bentley had his rabies vaccine? I mean, I'm not sure. I just came over from that other clinic across the street. Okay. Um, rabies vaccination is required by law here in Amarillo, Texas. Um, so initial here, and we will go ahead and perform a rabies vaccine on him. Okay. Okay, I just need you to sign down here to consent that we are going to anesthetize Bentley today. Put your phone number down. Okay, thank you for filling out the consent form. I will get his paperwork together. Okay, I'll go ahead and take Bentley to the back.
Okay, I have printed out a collar for our patient. This collar has his name on it. Um, it also has his owner information, her phone number, and the clinic's information on it. So I'll go ahead and place this on him. Okay, now we know who you are. We also have a cage card. And so this goes here, and this notifies all staff that this patient is here for a neuter um, to ensure that this patient gets the proper surgery, the proper medications. You match his collar with your surgery chart, and you make sure that the cage card states that he is having a neuter and make sure that that is correct. Okay, this is our patient's lab work that we just performed. And so this form shows um, all of our values. We have a complete CBC, chem, and light panel. Um, so this will tell if our patient has any abnormalities such as elevated liver or kidney values. Um, we've also got a urinalysis here. Um, and we've also got a thyroid test here. So um, if there were any indications that this patient is not a good candidate for anesthesia, we would be able to tell and then we would um, forego the operation. Okay, this is our anesthesia form. And here it has our patient's name, weight, and our um, client information. Um, this also where we would put our TPR. Um, our doctor would fill out um, the exam right here and give them an ASA physical status. This also has doses of medication that we would use, um, such as for induction, propofol. Um, it's got IV fluid rate here. Um, it's got oral medications to go home, local anesthesia. Um, on the back side of this anesthesia form, this is where you would document your patient's vitals every 15 minutes. Um, also, we've got our emergency drugs located down here and the doses. In case there were any anesthetic events, we would be able to locate this here and easily pull up the doses of drugs. Good afternoon, Mr. Williams. You're here to pick up Bentley? Well, yes, I am. Okay. Well, here's his discharge instructions. I'll go over these with you. Okay. So, for tonight, for Bentley, we strongly recommend keeping him confined in a crate or a small room where he can't fall from anything. He's going to be experiencing some grogginess from the anesthesia, so we don't want him to jump on the couch and accidentally fall off and hurt himself tonight. Um, he needs to remain inactive for one week after surgery. Running, jumping, playing, and going up and down stairs can cause the incision site to reopen. So well, can he go outside by himself or do we have to walk him around? He can go outside by himself. Okay. Um, just for tonight, watch him. Um, but um, after that, he can go outside and go potty okay. by himself. Um, let's see here. Do not give him any over-the-counter medications. Well, why? Um, because uh, Tylenol, ibuprofen, aspirin are very toxic to dogs. And also, um, we are sending you home with carprofen today, which is an NSAID for dogs to help with the pain. And that cannot be taken with Tylenol, ibuprofen, or aspirin. Those will cause uh, GI preparation issues with ulcers, okay? okay. Um, do not, um, please check in his incision site every day to make sure there's no swelling or drainage. Um, his incision site will be a little bit red and puffy today, but that should improve each day. Um, so just watch it there. Um, don't apply any ointments or creams to the incision site. Okay? What about a triple antibiotic ointment? No, do not put any triple antibiotic ointment on his incision site. Um, his sutures are interdermal, which means they are on inside, and so they will, you will not need to bring him back for a suture removal. Okay. Well, okay. What will it look like whenever I see? Um, so it will just look like a line. You will not be able to see any sutures on the outside. They're, they're all on the inside and they will dissolve over time. Well, will, will there be any uh, bleeding? There should not be any bleeding. If there is any bleeding, um, you need to call us and bring him back in right away. Because okay. uh, that would be a complication um, due to his surgery that he had today. Okay. Um, do not allow him to lick or chew on the incision site. If he does, then he'll need to wear an e-collar and you can purchase one of those from us or at the local pet store. Okay, just make sure that he's not licking that area because that could cause a complication. Of, he could reopen the incision site, um, he could cause swelling, he could cause drainage, and it could also cause a really bad infection. Oh, ew. Yeah, okay. you don't want to deal with that. So, 
Um, he had an IV catheter placed in his arm today. Maybe. Yes, and that was to administer fluids and medications. So um, we're gonna take that out and he'll have a Band-Aid on his arm. Make sure that you take that Band-Aid off as soon as you get home, okay? okay. Um, we prescribed some pain medication today called Carprofen. It is an inset and you're gonna give half a tablet in the morning and half a tablet in the evening. He can go ahead and have his first dose tonight at seven o'clock. Okay, and then he also had his rabies vaccine today. Okay, well, perfect. Are you a little tag or anything? Yes, you'll get a tag with that. Okay. Well, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll go get him for you. Okay, I'm going to demonstrate how to properly restrain for a jugular cephalic and a saphenous blood draw. So, whenever you're doing a jugular blood draw, you want to have your patient standing and you want to pull up their collars up above their neck and you want to hold their head up like this so that the person drawing the blood can access the jugular vein. Um, when you are restraining for a cephalic blood draw, you want to put your arm over the patient's neck and you want to extend their arm out and occlude the vein for the person restraining. When you are restraining for a saphenous, you want your patient in lateral recumbency like this and then you would hold off and roll the vein right here so that the person drawing blood can easily see the leg vein and draw from it. Okay, I'm going to demonstrate how to place a patient in and out of a cage. So, place them in here. You want to make sure that it latches all the way and since we are an AHA accredited hospital, you want to make sure that you lock the kennel. And to accurately get them out, Unlock this. Okay, I'm going to demonstrate how to place a dog muzzle. And so, place it over their nose like this. You want to buckle it behind the neck and pull it down tightly. Okay, I'll be demonstrating how to place an e collar on our patient. And so, you want to make sure that the fuzzy side is in and place this around the neck. You want to make sure that the Velcro is aligned as best as possible. Um, you want to make sure that you can rotate the e-collar, but you cannot pull it off of their head. Also, you want to make sure that you can get two fingers underneath the collar. Um, also, for some owners, it might be easier if you place the e-collar on the actual patient's collar with these loops provided. The other important thing about placing an e-collar is you want to make sure that it is longer than the patient's nose so that they cannot reach whatever they're trying to lick. Okay, I'm going to demonstrate a physical exam on a dog and I'm going to also show how to obtain a TPR in a school B heart and lungs. I will also um, give our patient an ASA grade. So, start with our physical exam. Start with the eyes to the ears. teeth. Looks like our patient has a grade 3 out of 5 dental disease. Also going to feel on our lymph nodes here. Submandibular and prescapular lymph nodes feel good. And turn them around. I'm going to palpate the abdomen. Belly is nice and soft. We'll attempt to put our legs in a range of motion, but he's quite tense. Okay, go ahead and listen to his heart and lungs.
Okay, heart and lungs sound great. Um, his pulse is 120. His respiratory rate is 30. I'll go ahead and get a temperature on him. Our temperature is normal, it is at 101.3. And I give him an ASA grade of one because I do not see any significant um, illness with this patient. Um, he seems to be very healthy overall upon physical exam. Um, he's not obese. He does not have any issues besides having a grade three out of five dental disease. And um, he's um, overall healthy. I see no risk with him for anesthesia. Any abnormal findings you may find on an exam would be a body score condition of greater than 5 out of 9, also a dental uh, score um, greater than 3 out of 5 um, would warrant us to want to do a dental cleaning or to look further into um, infection. Um, also, if they have a skin infection on their skin on their abdomen, it would probably be unsafe to open their abdomen for example a spay surgery or any type of abdominal surgery. Um, we would also want to make sure they don't have any type of wounds or any um, type of pain on on our physical exam that would determine um, that we, we should probably not anesthetize them at this time. Okay, so here is our physical exam on our cat, and so I'll go ahead and start with his eyes, ears, look at his mouth, he's got a grade 3 out of 5 dental disease, submandibular and prescapular and lymph nodes feel good. Okay. Okay, I'm going to escort the heart and lungs. His heart rate is 160. The respiratory rate is 40. Okay, I'm gonna feel your belly. Thank you. Belly feels nice and soft. temperature. He does have some arthritis in his front right shoulder. He's okay, baby. Okay, temp is at 101.1. Okay, so I give this cat an ASA grade of 2 because of his age. He is 13, um, the amount of dental disease that he has, and his arthritis. He's at a good body condition, uh, 5 out of 9. He's a little fluffy, but I can palpate his ribs well. Um, let's see here. He looks good back here. Um, the additional... Minimum databases that I would do for this cat would be um, lab work, just a full CBC, chem, light panel. I'd also check urine on him. We would want to do an ECG for him as well. I'm going to demonstrate how to draw blood. Um, so first I'm going to draw blood from the jugular vein. And so I like to soak the area with alcohol just to clean it. And also you can kind of see the vein a little bit better. So you want to occlude the vein at the thoracic inlet and then feel around 
with a vein, and then you want to stick in, bevel up at a 45 degree angle, and there's our sample. Okay, I'll go ahead and demonstrate how to do the cephalic blood draw. So, um, Nissa is holding off the vein for me, and I'm going to place some alcohol in the area just to clean it and also um, help visualize the vein. So, kind of, kind of palpate and feel around for the vein. You can kind of see it. Um, bevel up. There's our sample. Okay, I will demonstrate drawing blood from a lateral saphenous vein on a canine. So first I'm going to clean the area with some alcohol. Okay, we've got Nissa holding off. I'm gonna stabilize the vein with my thumb here. Make sure that you're bevel up. There we go, a little splash. And I do have some blood in my syringe. So. We are going to do a jugular blood draw on a cat. And so I'm going to hold off on the thoracic inlet. Just... <sighs> Mally, stop. Okay, buddy. Kitty. Good kitty. It's okay. Do you have your flash? Here's my flash and I'll get a little sample. Okay. Okay, I'm going to draw blood on the cephalic vein of a cat. And so I'm going to spray some alcohol here so that I can visualize the vein. And so you want to go bevel up. And usually these veins are very superficial. Got a small amount. Okay, I'm going to do a medial saphenous blood draw on a cat. So, I've got my needle, I'm going to spray the area with alcohol. And so, it's very superficial. There's our flash, there's our flash, and there's my sample. Okay, a minimum database for a young, healthy surgical patient should include a PCV, which is a packed cell volume, total solids, blood glucose, BUN, and ALT. In our hospital, our surgeons require a CBC, a complete blood count, a chem panel, uh, which would be a chem 17, and electrolytes. Um, sometimes we also do urinalysis with reflex, UPC, and a thyroid test. Um, additional database or tests that might be required based upon an abnormal physical exam could be an ad additional lab tests, radiographs, or ultrasound. Um, especially if our patient has a heart murmur, uh, we would want to do more lab work. We would also want to do x-rays and we would do a full echocardiogram um, before we put them under any anesthesia. Hey, this is Dr. Bo Schilling. He's my preceptor. And we are discussing a pre-anesthetic and peri-anesthetic protocol for a patient writer. He is here for a neuter today. So, Dr. Bo Schilling, um, what, uh, based on what we discussed, um, what did you choose for our analgesia for our patient today? So, we have our anesthetic protocol will involve giving him meds ahead of time. So, we're going to give him an NSAID called meloxicam that will provide, uh, it's the only anti-inflammatory pain medication we have. And that will last for about 24 hours and we'll send them home with doses as well to give after surgery. Um, for his pre-medicants, uh, pre we're going to use a sedative called Dexcomator. Um, that's a more potent sedative because he's a pretty wiggly patient and without that we may have a challenge getting his IV catheter placed. We're going to use buprenorphine, which is an opioid, which just provides pain relief. And then we'll use a non-pain med called glycopyrrolate to help him maintain his heart rate and decrease salivation during the procedure. Okay, you've also chosen us to give um, Combipin, um, and that's for pre-medication for antibiotics. Right, and so it's debatable to use perioperative. 
antibiotics, but we just want to minimize the risk of skin infections from surgery, especially in the first 24 hours, so that's why we use penicillin. Great, and then also we're going to induce anesthesia with propofol uh, for this patient. That's right, so uh, in order to get him intubated and get him on isofluorine gas, uh, which is his main anesthetic, we'll use propofol to induce anesthesia. Okay, sounds good. Okay, I'm going to show you how to log a controlled substance on a mock drug log. Um, so, you want to put the date. And you want to put the owner's last name. And the pet's name. Um, you want to go ahead and log the drug, so we'll pretend that we're going to use ketamine. And you want to put the amount, so I'm going to put 0 0.5, and you always want to make sure that you put a zero in front of your decimals, that way nothing gets confused. And then you're going to initial this, and then you're going to put your doctor's initials down. Okay, this is our anesthesia machine. It is a rebreathing system. So um, this is our flow meter. This is our cuff syringe. So we can inflate the cuff on our ET tubes. This is our soda lime canister or our CO2 absorber. This is our breathing tube. This is the inhalation undirectional valve. This is the exhalation undirectional valve. Here we have our pop-off valve, manometer. This is our vaporizer. Over here we have our O2 tank. This is our regulator. And this is our scavenging system. We also have our oxygen flush valve right here. Um, I'll go ahead and demonstrate how to do a leak test. So what you want to do is completely close your pop-off valve. You want to occlude your breathing tube with your thumb or you can also use the palm of your hand. And so you're going to uh, push on the oxygen flush valve until your manometer reaches 20. And so I'm going to go ahead and hold this here for about five seconds and you would know if there was a leak in the system if this meter is starting to slowly uh, go down to zero um, but luckily it looks like our system does not have a leak you should be doing this uh, before you anesthetize each patient um, before you hook them up to the system to make sure that there's no leaks and to make sure that the anesthetic gas does not leak out into the room Okay, we're prepping our patient for surgery, and I'm going to put on the pulse ox. This is going to monitor her SpO2 and her heart rate. I'll also hook up her ECG leads. The white probe goes on her right side, and the black one goes on her left, upper axillary, and then the red goes on the left inguinal. Also, I want to monitor temperature, so I will use a thermometer for that. Okay, I'm going to place the esophageal ECG probe, and I've got some lube on it. Um, if we had an esophageal stethoscope, we would place this in the esophagus the exact same way. Uh, we do not have that equipment here at our hospital, but the concept is the same. Um, so I'm going to measure it, and the way you measure it is you want it to the middle of the thorax, um, right above the heart. And so you place this, and you want to place it in the left side of the throat, and you want to make sure that you're very gentle. You do not want to damage the esophagus. And this is going to monitor her ECG, so the electrical activity in the heart, and it will also monitor her respiratory rate. I'm going to talk about gastric intubation. I'm not going to perform this task, but I'll just discuss how one would do it. Um, so you would want to place a roll of tape in the mouth. So it would be placed like this. And you would have your patient in sternal recumbency. Um, and then you would place the tube through the speculum into the esophagus. This is my preceptor, Dr. Bo Schilling, and he is helping me induce a patient today. We're going to be doing a neuter. Um, so this is my preceptor. There we go. I'm going to go ahead and place his IV catheter. Hold him for me and shoot his leg. 
I'm going to shave a spot to place his catheter. And I'm going to shave all the way around the leg so that I can place tape. I'm going to scrub the catheter spot with Corvex and alcohol. Go bevel up. There's our flash. Go ahead and secure this in with a cap. Let's tape this in. Okay, now I'm going to make sure that the catheter is patent, and to do that, I'm going to flush it with some saline, and you would just feel the vein, and I can definitely feel that it's in. Um, you would know that your catheter's not in if when you um, flush this with saline, if it starts to bubble up, then you would know that you are not in the vein. Okay, now I will demonstrate how to place a catheter in a lateral saphenous vein of a dog. And so I'm going to shave the area. Okay, now I'm going to clean the area with Clorhex and alcohol. Okay, so you want to make sure that your bevel is up and have Nissa hold off. I'm going to stabilize the vein with my thumb. There's my flash. I'll go ahead and feed the catheter now, and I'll place the cap on. It's definitely in. Okay, I'll go ahead and tape it in. Now I'm going to make sure that the catheter is patent, so I'm going to go ahead and flush and we'll make sure that we are in. 
if we are not in, we'll know because the area um, up here will start to bubble up. I'm definitely in and so now I'm just going to bandage this up with some vet all done okay we are going to pre-med our patient I'm going to give him an IM injection of um, Dextome and buprenorphine and glyco and this is considered his pre-medication so we're going to call this a kid. So, I'm going to place my finger over the sciatic nerve. I'm going to poke away from the bone, pull back to make sure I'm not in a vessel, and inject. I'm also going to give him some um, sub Q injections. This is his pain medication. This is called meloxicam. And you just make a skin tint. You're so pretty. Pull back. Thank you. Okay, I'm getting ready to induce our patient for his neuter. I'm going to go ahead and measure his ET tube. And so, to measure the diameter, you want to um, see if the tip of this is the width of his nose, and it is. And then you want to make sure that leaf flies it's good, and so you would measure it from the mouth to the thoracic inlet. And so, looks like this is going to be the perfect size. Um, before I place his IV catheter and before I give him the propofol, I'm going to pre-oxygenate him for five minutes. <coughs> and so we'll come back in five minutes after this patient has been pre-oxygenated. Okay, I'll go ahead and induce our patient with our anesthetic agent. It is called propofol. And I'm going to give this IV. And you want to give this slowly, not too fast, because you can drop their blood pressure. And you give this to a pet. So um, I'll give this until he's ready to intubate. Okay. Okay, I'm going to use a laryngoscope to intubate him. So I'm going to grab his tongue and I'm going to place the speculum in the mouth and I'm going to um, use the speculum to um, open up the uh, epiglottis so I can see the arytenoids. And I'll just go ahead and place uh, the tube in his trachea. You want to be gentle so that you do not damage the trachea. And then I'm going to secure his tube with this. I'm going to inflate the cup. So I'm going to use a syringe to put some air in the cuff. It's important that you don't overflate the cuff or underinflate the cuff. If you underinflate the cuff, then they'll be breathing room air and that would dilute their ISO, which is their um, anesthetic gas that keeps them under anesthesia during surgery. And you don't want to overinflate it because you could cause damage to the tree. So I'm going to put him on oxygen at one and put him on some ISO two. And then I'm going to move his eyes with artificial lube. I'm going to make sure that our patient's tube is properly placed, so I'm going to listen while Macy gives a breath and see if I hear any movement around the tube. I do not hear any movement. If I were to hear movement around the tube, I would need to inflate the cuff a little bit more. Um, I'm also going to listen to his chest while she gives him a breath to make sure that he's oxygenating um, both lungs because we don't want um, a lung to collapse if we've not placed it correctly.
Okay, I can hear air moving on both lungs, so our tube is placed correctly. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and clip and scrub our patient. So I have a surgery jacket on, I have gloves, I have a cap on, I have a mask on, and I am um, that way that I protect my scrubs from any hair that gets on them when I shave. So I'll go ahead and shave. This patient is getting a neuter, so I'm going to shave most of his inguinal region. Okay, now that I have our patient shaved, I am going to express his bladder. So, this off the way. I'm going to pop it here. Go ahead and express it. off some of this urine before I scrub. Okay, so now I'm going to scrub with Chlorhex and alcohol. So first I'll start with Chlorhex. So you want to scrub in a circular motion. So I know that the surgeon is going to place his incision here, so I'm going to make sure that that area is clean. I'm only going to scrub him three times out here because I will do a sterile scrub when I get into the OR. Okay, we're ready to transport our patient into the OR. Okay, we're going to go ahead and transport our patient to the OR. And so, we're not going to use any of these towels to take into the OR because they are not clean. And we want to make sure that we keep our OR as clean as possible because we are an AHA accredited clinic. So, we're not going to touch the surgery site. We're just going to transport him into the surgery room. First, going to go ahead and hook him up to oxygen and ISO so that he is maintained on anesthesia. Okay. Now I'm going to place him on the table and secure him to the table with some leashes. I'm going to make sure I keep a record of his vitals. So here's where we log our vitals here. So his heart rate is at 118. 
we are oxygenating at 99. Our ISO is at two and a half. Our oxygen is at one. And once our uh, probes start to work a little bit better, we'll be able to get respiration rate is 14. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and do a sterile scrub on our patient before surgery. So I've got our sterile scrub here. And I'm going to go ahead and scrub him. You wanna make sure you're doing it in a circular pattern so that you don't put your gauze over the surgery site. Okay, I'll be demonstrating how to do CPR. Uh, we would do CPR if a patient went into cardiopulmonary arrest. Um, so what you want to do is have the patient on their right side and you're going to want to put your hand under their elbow um, on the left side of their chest. And for large dogs, you would want to use two hands to pump. For a small to medium dog, you could use one. And for a cat, you would want to place your um, hand around their thorax and pump for them this way, since they are so small. Um, you want to pump about 100 to 100 beats per minute, and the American Heart Association recommends beating to um, the rhythm of staying alive by the Bee Gees. So, um, if this was a large dog, you would do CPR this way. Staying alive, staying alive, ah, 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 ah. Staying alive, staying alive. Okay, this is my makeshift ambu bag. We do not have one here in clinic, um, but I will demonstrate how to use it. So um, if a patient were to go into cardiopulmonary arrest, we would attach this to their mouth and their nose and we would squeeze it in order to breathe for them. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and scrub in for our procedure. So I've already put my mask and my cap on and I've also got my shoe covers on. So the first step is to open up your gown. We're gonna lay it out over here. And then I am going to open my gloves so that once I'm done scrubbing, I can touch these. Okay, now I am going to go ahead and turn on the sink and I'm going to go ahead and open this up. This is our scrub. So you want to remove all jewelry, any watches, anything. Um, so I'm now ready to scrub in. Make sure everything's adjusted here. So go ahead and get my hands wet. You can use this to um, pick under your nails. And the reason that we scrub in this way before we go into surgery is because in case you accidentally pop a glove open, um, your hands are as clean as possible. So whenever you scrub in, you want to make sure that you're using a soft bristle brush and not something that's too hard because you can cause abrasion. And then you can introduce even more microorganisms onto your skin. So proper scrub procedure is 10 swipes on each, on each side of the finger. So... I'm going to scrub on this lateral side of my finger 10 times. Now I'm going to go to the bottom surface. And I'll go to this other side. And the top. The lateral on this finger.
and then you're going to work your way down. I'll go ahead and do the, my other hand. So start with the lateral side of your finger. It's in time. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and drop this in the sink. You want to make sure that you keep your elbows up. And to rinse, you're going to start with the tips of your fingers and then go down. Just make sure not to touch anything. And I'm going to go ahead and turn this off with my elbow, making sure that my hands are staying up. And then I'm going to take my towel to dry off with. And I'm going to use the top half of it to dry off my hands. So I'm going to work my way down, starting with my fingers and going down my arm. And then I'll take the other side and dry off my other hand. Okay. Now I'm going to drop that and I'm going to put my gown on. So you want to make sure that you get the back side of this and not the front because the front is the sterile part. And I'm going to do closed clothing so I'm going to make sure that my hands are staying in the sleeve. Okay, now I'm going to put my gloves on, and so I'm going to go ahead and start with my right one. So I'm going to grab my glove like this, the thumb, and then I'm going to flip it over and open it up. Making sure not to touch anything. And then I'm going to go ahead and slip this on. Just touch my sleeves. And here. There we go. This one might be a little easier. Maybe. <laughs> okay. And I'm going to have Dr. Schilling tie me in. 
and I want to make sure that I keep my hands, my elbows above my waist so that I stay sterile. Dr. Schilling's blade ready for him. Our patient isn't actually bleeding, but if you were, we would block like this. And that would keep the surgeon's field of vision clear as he's doing surgery. Okay, I will place our scalpel blade on our scalpel blade holder. Dr. Schilling, as soon as he's ready. Okay, Kenzie, can you hand me the needle drivers, please? Yes, sir. Send a picture to Angie. And the brown ads and forceps. Excellent, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, you can hand me the blade now. Okay, in order to keep my sterile technique, I will keep my elbows and hands above my waist and keep my hands crossed when I'm not assisting the surgeon. In the event that I broke my sterile technique, such as dropping an instrument, I could ask someone to bring us another instrument. Um, if I tore my glove, I would just go and scrub in again and um, re-gown in glove. Okay, I'm participating in a canine neuter with Dr. Dodson. I'm participating in a canine spay with Dr. Dodson. I'm participating in a feline spay with Dr. Dodson today. I'm participating in a feline neuter today with Dr. Beauchelin. And so now I'm going to go ahead and clean our surgery suite. Um, so first thing I want to do is I want to get rid of these sharks. So I'm going to go ahead and take the sharks out of our surgery pack. And here's our um, needle from our suture. That in our sharps container. Okay. If there are any hazardous waste, we would want to go ahead and dispose of that properly. Um, so, if there were any um, body, um, such as testicles or any type of bodily fluids in here, um, we would want to bag that up appropriately and, and dispose of that correctly. Um, so, we've already done that. So, I'm going to go ahead and just clean this up. So, throw away our drape, throwing away trash. Picking up things off the floor, I'm going to get this ready to go to the sink. I'm going to put all the dirty laundry in the same laundry basket because since we are an AHA accredited facility, we have to wash everything together that was in the surgery suite. So. Here's our surgery laundry basket, and here was where we did our sterile prep. So I'm going to throw this stuff away, and I'll just put everything I want to wash right up here, and that's going to go in the sink when we're done. These are our bed buddies. Put that in the laundry as well. Up. Also, it's very important to wipe off your anesthetic monitoring equipment after you're finished so that it's clean for the next patient. So I'll go ahead and do that. We're just going to use a basic disinfectant for this. Socks. And I'll go ahead and 
between our ECG tubes or our ECG leads, what I meant to say. unhook all of this stuff. That way I can start putting it away. Okay. Okay, now that our surgery suite is clean, I will take our instruments and I will go wash them. We soak our instruments in Clorhex solution and water. Okay, I'll go ahead and wash some of our instruments. So, what you want to do is it's important to knock all of the blood off of these instruments because um, our autoclave will not do that for us. So, the reason why we scrub them is so that we can make sure that we get all of the blood off. And I scrub the handles too because sometimes blood can get on the handles. And rinse it off, make sure and inspect it. And then we put it in instrument milk, and that is going to lubricate the joints of the instrument. And that's just going to make sure that it opens and closes easier. Okay. Okay, I will demonstrate how to wrap a pack. So you need to count out a stack of 12 pieces of gauze. <coughs> I'm ready for bow. Bow! Okay. So I've got 12 pieces in this stack. Let me count out another 12. Okay. So now I'm going to put my instruments together. I like to sort these out. Make sure I have everything that I need. I want to stack these up. Some forceps into my scissors. And then I just wrap it this way. all together and it's tight. <coughs> it's important the way that you wrap this because the technician is going to open this in the surgery suite. So I want to make sure that all of this has tags on it so we can grab it. Place that on top. And then pull this over the top on a corner. You're going to tuck this in and you want to make sure that you leave a tag so that the technician can open this in surgery. Okay, this is a surgical gown. I'm going to wrap it to make sure that it's sterile. And so first step is to lay this out and you want to go ahead and lint roll the sleeves. Make sure that there's no hair or any type of lint. So we do not want that to be in the surgical field. Uh oh. Okay. So first thing, first lay this out this way. Get it straight here. And so I'm going to take the top right here. I'm going to fold this in half this way. Set it right here. I'm going to put the sleeves on the inside. Get this out. Flip it over. I'm going to put the sleeves on the inside here so that they're not touching anything on the outside. Put 
this in here as well. Okay, now I'm going to fold this part back. Flip it over again, fold this part back. And then I'll accordion fold it to the top. And it's important on these to make sure that the top strings are out so that whenever you open this, the surgeon is able to pick these up and open up their gown. So I've got that all at the top kind of tighten it down and then you want to put this on top because this is what they're going to dry their hands off with and so here's my towel I'm going to put this on here to ensure that this is sterile you're going to put a steam indicator strip here and so once this is autoclave this blue box is going to turn black and that's how you're going to know that this is sterile so I'll go ahead and put this in here and then I'm going to wrap this just like I wrapped the pack Make sure that there are tags available so that our technician can open this when they go into surgery. So I've got my tag right here. I'm going to make sure that this is wrapped very tightly. Just like this and I've got my tag sticking out here. And then you're going to use autoclave tape. This is also going to um, determine if this gown is sterile because after this is autoclaved, these little white kind of clear stripes are going to turn black. And that's how you're going to know that this is sterile. Okay, this is our autoclave. We have a digital automatic sterilizer. And so it's very simple to use. Um, so you always want to make sure that your water is filled up and you want it to be within this green area right here and it is so whenever you pack an autoclave you want to make sure that you do not overpack it because then your items will not get sterile so i'm just going to put a couple of things in here just a couple of gowns and then we're going to go ahead and close this and you select your cycle and this is going to um, let us know the um, degree that it's going to do and so it's going to be 250 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes and that's going to sterilize our packs. Okay our autoclave is finished and so to ensure that your pack is sterile or your gown um, you can see here that the tape has turned black. Once we open this you would be able to see the steam indicator strip and you would look at it to make sure that that blue box has turned completely black. Okay, I'm going to perform a suture removal, and so what you want to do is um, you want to have suture removal scissors, and they have a little notch at the top, and so I'm just going to, you can use some forceps to pull the suture up so you can see it, and then you just remove. Um, so. Things that would indicate that you do not want to remove the sutures is if the incision is not fully closed, um, if it's swollen, if there's any oozing or any type of pus, then you would not want to remove the sutures and you would just alert the attending veterinarian. Um, that way they can examine it and kind of determine what we would need to do.